Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show, and you definitely got tickets. And drinks. Now hurry and make it back to your spot. Pass this person and that person about 20 more. Ooh, watch out for feet. Hey. Just keep going. A little further. Oh, there's your friend. Over here. Right where you want to be. Close enough to see the set list. And they're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, you guys. It's Christine Blackburn with Storyworthy. And I just want to give everybody a big shout out saying thank you so much for listening to the show, for subscribing on iTunes, and for joining our mailing list, which Hannes laughs about. But honestly... <laughs> It's a lot of fun, and we appreciate each and every one of you. So once again, thanks so much, folks. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at StoryWorthy. StoryWorthy Media, the best in story-driven content. Hi, it's actor director Dan Frischman, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to the Storyworthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Finney. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm here with Hannes Finney, and we're coming to you from Musso and Frank's, the famous Hollywood restaurant on Hollywood Boulevard. Now, that restaurant is one of the oldest restaurants in Hollywood. It is. All the big stars used to go there. You got your uh, table that Humphrey Bogart used to sit at, and you got your table that William Faulkner sat at, and uh, oh, it's fantastic. Well, there's all sorts of iconic photos all over the restaurant of, you know, Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra, and everything is white linens and high ceilings and real silver. Yeah, real dark wood, like dark from, wood. from the yeah. 19 teens. Yeah, real silverware. And then the menu is so humorous. Because the food is just... They have not updated it. I haven't been there very often, but I, well, last time I was there, they had st- I had Steak Diane. <laughs> now, they haven't made Steak Diane in a restaurant in about 75 years, except for Musso and Frank's, as far as I can remember. Yeah, see, I wish I didn't know you were going to say we're coming from Musso and Frank's, except for the fact, that, of course, we're here. So I would have looked at the menu, but I know there's a lot of things on the menu, like locks and... And bagels, because it is a Jewish deli in a way, isn't it? Just no, kind of no, no, up, no, no, no. Upscale? No, just look around uh, as we sit here. No, Musso Frank's is an upscale restaurant. I know that, but it, but at the same time, the food, the choices no, the on food, the menu. The food is what uh, you would have thought was fantastic in 1938. Okay, so pull up the menu. Let's All see right. this menu at Musso and let Frank's. Me, let me just reach over now and get the menu, which is right here. Uh, for instance, our daily feature on uh, Tuesdays, corned beef and cabbage. Well, that's what I'm saying. Wednesday's sour broughton and potato pancakes. Who else is serving sour? Well, you would like that, the sour broughton. Sour broughton. I love sour broughton. God, I haven't had sour broughton since I was at Mater's in Milwaukee. That's an old German restaurant with a big suit of armor and and a whole bunch of, uh, here, Musso's fennel cakes. This place is fantastic. Here we got steaks and chops. And we got, uh, you know, we got your uh, calves liver steak. See, you don't, you don't get so a lot of calves liver house. steak. It's a steakhouse. It's a steakhouse. It's a steakhouse. But it's got so much history. But I remember also being there. If you go into just the bar, you can get like because it's crazy expensive. Yeah, crazy expensive, but it's expensive. And and you go in the bar and you have like a martini, and it almost comes with a sidecar. <laughs> That's right, the little shot of alcohol. Accompanying- but the martini is made bigger than the glass you drink it in, so the rest of it is in a little. Uh, little uh, metal thing on the on the side there. On the side, And yeah. I was talking to the bartender there, and he is a guy who's been there for like 50 years, right? And he would often be gone. He's a, at this point, older Hispanic man. He would be gone for months at a time because mm-hmm. the Rolling Stones would hire him to be their backstage <laughs> bartender when they would go <laughs> on tour. Fantastic. So this Yeah, so this there's this like, you know, 75-year-old, you know, Hispanic man in a bow tie, and he's backstage at the... 
you know, and making up drinks. It's like absolutely, oh, it's the best. Well, that's very much Musso and Frank's. It's definitely yeah. a high end, high end restaurant with white with, jackets and coattails and things like that. Yeah, it's got history. And the reason why we're coming from Musso and Frank's, yes, let's get to the point. Because the point I our, we, have, we never get to the point, and that's the point of our show. Because no. our guest tonight, Dan Frischman, is here. Yes. Dan Frischman, and he is an actor, and he's been around Los Angeles for several decades. Yes. Honest, he is. Yes, and he has actually well. There's a lot of actors that have been around for several decades. You've actually seen him. That's the no, difference. No, no, He's actually I mean, been a, on television. Well, that's what I mean, a working actor. A working actor. He's been a working actor for several decades, and he continues to work. So he's got what we call a body of work. Yes. And he doesn't stop. He also is multi-talented. What? So he's like you're the, saying he's a hyphenite. He's like a quadruple threat because he's an actor, he's a singer, yeah, he's a musician, and he's a magician. What? Oh, so excited until what the end. The- no, I'm kidding. I love the magician. I love. No, that yes. is such a talent. Obviously, well, so a lot of people in comedy started in uh, in in magic. Uh, famously, uh, Johnny Carson. Oh, you know was, what? I wanted to be a magician for years. And Steve Martin. Steve Martin as well. If yes. you head over to danfrishman.com, and Frishman, by the way, F-R-I-S-C-H-M-A-N, danfrishman.com, you will see the many facets of this talented man's life. And tonight, he brings forth the topic, when I first got to Hollywood. Which is always, people love that. When it's I like, first got to Hollywood. what do you do when Hollywood. you first get to Hollywood? Yeah, because if you come from the Midwest, like I did from Pittsburgh, and you did, Hannes, from Wisconsin, Dan Frishman from New Jersey, if you come from those parts of the country and your family has you know, never been in show business, then it is, at least for me, growing up in the yeah, 70s Yeah, it almost doesn't 80s. matter. You can come from New York City. You can come from Washington, D.C. You can come yeah. from a sophisticated urban place. It doesn't prepare you for Los Angeles, and it certainly doesn't prepare, prepare you for show business, which is just a weird, exaggerated sort of high school-y existence with a lot of drinking and a lot of mind games. And Yeah, but I'm not even talking about that angle. I'm talking about the business as it as what is the business. Yeah. A lot of people sitting around in America and the rest of the world think that there's just right. an you can't actor. apply for a job in show business. They think like you can apply for a job at IBM. They, they think there's a director and they think there's an actor. That's who they think there are. They don't understand the lighting department, the sound department. They don't understand renting stages and locations and they don't get it. And so when you come from the middle of nowhere, well, yeah. I shouldn't say that. When you come from other places in the country... You know, when you first get to Hollywood, there's a lot of myths that are shattered very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And there's magic, but the magic isn't where you think it is. And it's like it 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 turns strange very quickly. And I, I always think of uh, William Goldman, one of the great screenwriters of all time. He wrote uh, Bush Cassidy and Sundance Kid, among other things. He also wrote a great book about Hollywood in which he stated the secret of Hollywood is a secret of show business is nobody knows anything. Yeah. And it's true. Nobody knows anything. Nobody has any idea. Or is it nobody knows what they want? No. Nobody knows anything. Nobody knows anything. Like whatever Dan Frischman could tell us about his successful career will have no impact on our careers. (laughs) It's like it doesn't. I mean, it was particular to whatever he did. Yeah. In if other you're words, in a different yeah, circumstance, you're dealing equate. with a different person. It doesn't, right. it's not. It doesn't equate. In other it's words, not like, hey, you go into triple, you go into, you yeah. know, double A ball, you graduate to triple A ball. Hopefully you get to the show and you play in the major leagues. Right. It doesn't work like that. Or you go to law school and then you become a lawyer. Yeah, and then or you, you take go, an exam and now you're a lawyer. Right. Or you want to be a doctor. Then you do a residency. Then you take a test and you're a doctor. It yeah. doesn't work that way in show business. You can be on Broadway your whole life, come to LA, never get an agent. Yeah, exactly. And so here we are podcasting, heading into our sixth year in July, you know, Hannes. Yeah. Well, podcasting is the is the new wave. <laughs> the podcasting money is just rolling in, oh, as you know out there, folks. Podcasting is the, is the wave of the future, people. No, listen, let me tell you something, though. Hang as on, let you me take know, my gold shoes off. As you know, Hannes, Storyworthy is like my labor of love. Of love. Like, I love doing this, and here's the way I think. I'm not kidding. And this could be the cancer survivor in me talking, but if you have all humble the- Humble brag. If you yeah. have- Yeah, that's a humble brag. <laughs> I'm going to use that clip. Uh, if you have all the money in the world, what are you going to do spending your life? How are you going to spend your life? Yeah. If I had all the money in the world, you know what I want to be doing? I want to be sitting in this room with Avery Pearson, Dan Frischman, and you. How about that? That's right. But we'd have better chairs. I, w- I would have better chair. Now, I like this chair. What's wrong with your chair? Uh, nothing. I'm just saying. 
We We'd would be, all be wearing slightly more comfortable clothes. We would be on. We'd have slightly better furniture. We would be on camera, and We'd it would be, be on it. the television. That's what would be happening. Beyond the television, Grandma. Well, beyond the television. So let me just tell you: when I first got to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. hey, listen, you, we just brought up the cancer, so yeah, here right. we go. I had just finished chemotherapy, so I didn't have any hair. Yeah. So I couldn't get any pictures taken. I couldn't. Like really be seen. Yeah. <laughs> no, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really escalate my career as it were. Yeah. So I set about to learning about Hollywood. And the first thing I did was got a job in front of the man's Chinese theater, giving tours of the movie stars homes. Yes. There you go. And, and, and they were always basically, it should have said former homes of stars who are now dead. Right. Right. That was always never anybody was. And currently are alive. Right. Because we would give, we would give the tours of, you know, the Hollywood stars homes tours. So it'd be, you know, we'll take you to Beverly Hills, Homeby Hills, Rodeo Drive and Bel Air. But everybody, all the houses, Frank Sinatra, Lucille Ball, everybody's dead. Yeah. Or they've, because the stars now all live in Malibu. So it was more like just these are the lawyers' houses and the producers, yeah, yeah. but not the actual stars. But nonetheless, um, I learned a lot. And here's what I learned. The rest of the world really likes the celebrity. That's what I learned. Yeah, they're crazy. Like they really, yeah, they, they really think that celebrities are different. You would be giving tours through Hollywood on the, I'd be giving tours on this double decker bus and going, you know, I would just have to say, blah, 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 Brad Pitt, blah, 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 blah. Renee Zellweger, yeah. blah, you know, because that's all they want. And then you'd hear their ears perk up. Yeah. And they probably couldn't even speak English well enough I to understand say anything frequently because they didn't speak English to begin with. Yeah. Other than that, folks, it's a great tour. The, well, the Hollywood thing, tour. The thing that we that, that that you don't get about fame when you're not in a place that's loaded with famous people is that there's levels of fame, mm -hmm. and and that's where it becomes very high schooly. Is like there's there's the people at the very very top, and that's very few people. You got your Brad Pitts, you got your Tom Hanks, you got people that are instantly recognizable to and, everyone, and, and probably people that don't have to audition, as it were. Right, right. That they very tiny amount of people. Made, yeah. And then there are a lot of other people that you that you'll see all the time and they are they are successful. They are nice or not nice. Usually they actually they're they're surprisingly nice. But it's like they you know, there's always a, a humbleness in a way about a person who is on television regularly but is aware that there are like Icons. Well, there's a gratefulness, I yeah. think, because yeah. they realize that they got lucky. You know, there's a talent and there's a preparedness that meets the opportunity. But at the end of the day, a lot of people could do it. Yeah, I think there's a lot. Of, yeah, everybody in successful in show business knows people who are just as talented as them mm -hmm. who aren't as successful because there was a certain amount of luck and that timing that mm -hmm. just didn't pan out. Listen, the second thing I did when I got to Hollywood, I did the movie stars homes tours. For six months. And yeah. then I got a job at Paramount. And that really did help me a lot. I was a page uh, and a tour guide at Paramount. And so I really got to understand what a soundstage was. I understood I understood different sets. I understood how it worked, the audience and the interaction between the director and the writers and the actors and the makeup and how many people it takes to make these productions happen. So Paramount was my real education because coming from Pittsburgh... I had no idea. Yeah, the fact, you know, it's called a dream factory. There's a factory aspect to it. Well, this was we also before we all had a camera in our pocket. You know, this is before we could all shoot anywhere we are. And, you know, I know, yeah, back. So yeah. This, I'm talking about the late 90s when I got here. I know, I know. I did a video of my dog the other day. I was like, this looks better <laughs> than the television I watched when I was a kid. <laughs> it was like, how is it possible? This is clearer. And and more rich color and and sharp than you know. I used to watch, you know, uh, reruns of Adam Twelve on a black and white TV, and I was like, "This is awesome!" It's like it's <laughs> shit compared to what I can now do in my pocket. Well, listen, this is going to be great. I'm really looking forward to talking to Dan Frischman and his story when I first got to Hollywood. So we're going to learn what he did when he first got here. But before Dan comes on, I did want to mention that if you'd like to support the Storyworthy podcast, hmm. and you know, there are people that support us, Hannes. There are supporters. There are people who actually support us with finances, which I is can, amazing. I can name names. You want to hear some you names? Might, yeah, let's hear some names. Michael Adler. Yeah. Scott Howell. Yeah. Jane Neal. Yeah. Stu Gillickson. Yes. You know who you are. 
Yeah, that's right, you people. I will come. Now that we've mentioned your names. I will come to your house and I will reach through your computer well, and take your neck in my hand. Wait a minute. I'm usually threatening people who are good to us. Pull Why are you, you threatening forward people who are good to us? <laughs> and give you a big kiss and I'll say thank oh. you. Thank you so much oh. for yes. supporting us. We appreciate it. You can follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at StoryWorthy. And of course, head on over to Facebook and why not interact with us there? That's right. That's right. Remember to go to iTunes and just subscribe to us. You don't have to actually listen. You just have to subscribe. Download, then you can erase all of it. We don't care. We need numbers, people. All right, you guys, wherever you are, stick around because Dan Frischman is on his way here. Next time on Storyworthy, we have comedian and musician Henry Phillips. I will be telling a story of extreme debauchery happening after a show where I was the opening act for a famous comedian. That's next time on Storyworthy. Hey, it's Wendy McClendon Cubby. You're listening to Storyworthy. And we're back. We have actually left Muso and Frank's crossed Hollywood Boulevard down Las Palmas to Michelli's. Michelli's Pizzeria, a very old fashioned sort of 40s pizzeria here on uh, just off Hollywood Boulevard. But it's where they not have the singing a, waiters. And it's not just a pizzeria, that's a full on Italian restaurant. It's a full on Italian restaurant. And from, your... and from Michelli's, if you look straight up the hill on Las Palmas, uh-huh. you will see on the right hand side, this is the Hollywood tour guide coming out uh-huh. on me, yeah. the balcony of which Julia Roberts stood on. Richard Gere actually climbed to get his Pretty Woman at the end of Pretty Woman. That mm. was like Julia Julia Roberts' apartment, and you could see the Hollywood sign from behind it. So I think that's why they chose that shot. That's iconic. That's fabulous. You don't care. Spoiler alert, by the way. Oh wait, the movie's eight hundred years old. Doesn't matter. No, I do care. I really don't care. I don't care. All right, you guys, Dan Frischman's here right now. He's a writer and a director. And you know, Hannes, he's probably best known for his series regular roles on ABC's Head of the Class Mm -hmm. and Nickelodeon's Kenan and Kel. Uh, Plus, he's also been in numerous TV and film roles. Now, as we talked about, he began his career as a professional magician, the great Houdini. (laughs) <laughs> the Great Who Danny. That's pretty funny, right? The Great yeah. Who Danny. Before he segued into stand up comedy, and he has performed on The Late Night with David Letterman and Evening at the Improv. And he also has a book out, a novel, Hannes, not just a memoir, what? a novel called Jackson and Jenks. It's for kids. So, uh, yeah, it's like uh, like uh, in that, that Percy Jackson kind of a thing, right? For the kids. I don't know about that. You're aware of Percy Jackson and the, uh, I forgot what You can was. ask him about it. Yeah. Anyway, that book, Jackson and Jenks, Master Magicians, it's available everywhere. And you can find Dan over at Dan Can you Fish- buy it at Amazon by clicking on the Amazon banner at uh, storyworthypodcast.com? You can, in fact, do that. Wow. And some people do. Actually, Hannes, how about that? Every month we get a little taste and a little little Amazon coupon, and it helps. It really does. All right, you guys, you can find Dan over at danfrischman.com and on Twitter at whodanny. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Dan Frischman. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, Christine and Hannes. Uh, I want to talk about my uh, early beginnings in Hollywood, but it also requires me to preamble a bit about uh, starting out at the comic strip nightclub in New York City, where we find me at age uh, 19 as one of the late nighters. I performed with the likes of Dennis Miller, uh, and uh, we were new, so they put us on after the regular show was over. So at 1 a.m., we'd all just gather around and they'd say, okay, you, you, and literally we'd go on for five people who were there because they missed their bus. And I, I actually got big laughs by just reading the bus schedule sometimes because uh, people are like, OK, OK, we'll, we'll leave. I was a big fan at the time also of Robin Williams, who had just hit the scene. And he was uh, he was the big star on uh, on Mork and Mindy. And so all I wanted out of life, out of life, was to meet Robin Williams. Uh, well, I read that he we would be performing at the Copacabana nightclub. So I thought, well, how can I, as an underage kid, get into the Copacabana nightclub? And I thought, okay, I'll write a Mork and Mindy episode. I had never written an episode of anything. And I'll present it to the uh, the doorman. He'll say, oh, of course we'll let Dan Frischman in because he's got a script for Mr. Williams. So I wrote uh, an episode. I just wrote off the top of my head. Uh, it was called The Incredible Shrinking Mork, in which Mork uh, becomes very quite diminutive. And I wrote a half hour and I went, uh, my cousin and I drove in my parents' uh, station wagon. 
with the wood paneling and uh, pulled up in front of the Copacabana nightclub. And I got out and uh, walked up to the doorman named Bennett, I recall. And I said, I have a script for Mr. Williams. I'd like to give it to him. And he, Mr. Ms. Bennett and the other uh, doorman just looked at me and laughed. Uh, but Bennett was very nice. And he said, listen, if you give me the script, I will give it to Robin's uh, managers. Uh, the Copa managers, they will give it to Robin's managers. Great. I felt like I just scored big. Uh, the next day I'm at home. It's the tax season. My father's a CPA. The phone's ringing off the hook. Always for him. But I think, you know what? Robin's people are from Hollywood. They know how to do what was then called emergency break-in. <laughs> And they will break in and say, okay, we have you know, Mr. Frischman is Mr. Frischman there. And my father will have to hang up. Well, they never called. I was heartbroken and crushed. And weeks went by. And then a couple months went by. And then my brother, Bill, who, who was uh, going to Ohio University, uh, called me. And he said, um, Dan, I just heard on the radio they're putting together a million-dollar Mork and Mindy episode to open the second season in which Mork shrinks. And I thought, oh my goodness, what a coincidence. I had written an episode called The Incredible Shrinking Mark. Well, we began to think, what if it wasn't such a big coincidence? So my father spoke with a lawyer friend of his in New York, and it was going to cost $1,000 for a court injunction. I didn't have any money, so um, nor did I have it protected. Uh, I think I just sent a copy to myself, and, you know, and they said, well, that's not really the deal. So we just let it go. Now, for the second season, they actually changed characters uh, from uh, they added they got rid of uh, Mindy's parents and added uh, uh, the, the Delhi people. It was uh, Jay Thomas uh, and ah, my, my good friend whose name I can't remember. So I hope she's not listening. <laughs> Gina Heck. Thank you. And uh, so my script was now not really uh, apropos. But I'm watching it with a friend when they when it finally aired and there's a knock on the door and I say it's Mr. Bickley from downstairs and he's got a new dog and they're going to leave the dog in with Mork. The door opens. There's Mr. Bickley with his new dog. Hey, I've got a new dog. And they come in and they put it and, and they put it down. Now Mork, of course, is, is shrunk and there's going to be pro trouble with the dog and Mork and they leave. And then something completely different happens. But I did have that little seed uh, of knowledge. Now. In their defense, I might think, well, if you're going to uh, have Mork uh, be in distress when he's little, how would you get a dog? You know, how, what would you get in there? Maybe a dog. How would you get the dog there? It would have to come from Mr. Bickley. So it's not out of the at a, a huge stretch that they made that up to. Um, so I'm not saying they stole. However, once I got out here to Los Angeles. I was working at the Comedy Store nightclub. I was a gopher. I would do whatever I could to get spots on the show. Uh, and so I would talk. And, and then people would come up to me. Everyone had a card uh, that said manager on it. So if you, if you had a card that said manager on it, bam, you're a manager. And one of these guys came up to me and he wanted to help. And he was actually a very well-meaning person. And I told him about this story and he said, let's call up the Mork and Mindy producers. The, the show was still on. Let's say, hey, you didn't, it's not that you were saying you stole our story idea, but uh, could you possibly give Dan another shot? Just take a look at the script to see how similar it is to the wonder that you came up with on your own and give Dan another try uh, to, at, at his own script. Uh, so he called up and it took him a, uh, maybe two weeks and I was with him when he finally got someone on the phone. It was one of the producers of the show. The produce, it was the shortest conversation uh, in Hollywood to that to date. Uh, it, the producer said, uh, he said, uh, I'm representing Dan Frischman. My manager said, I'm representing Dan Frischman. We had the script. And the producer said, uh, does he want to sue? And my, uh, my manager said, uh, no, that's not the point. Click. And that was, the, that was the end of that. Now, cut to a year after that. I'm living in a house. Uh, called it was called the, the, it was the infamous Crest Hill House above the Comedy Store in the hills uh, with seven comedians including Andrew Dice Clay and Yakov Smirnov and other comedians you might know. Uh, so all the comedians would be up there at some point in the big parties and things. And one night I was uh, in my little uh, I had I had the smallest room it was like a sewing room I, the the couch almost fit in there the pull out couch and uh, so I was sitting in bed watching a comedian on TV. 
uh, and there's a knock on my door. I figure it's one of the comedians who wants to use my phone because I was one of the f- one of two comedians who actually paid their phone bill. <laughs> and the door opens, and it's Robert Williams just by himself. And he says, uh, "Excuse me, uh, uh, may I use your phone?" He was visiting one of the other comedians, of course. At the, I had no idea he was there, and it was the first time I'd, I'd seen him outside of him performing at the comedy store. And I was just, I, I couldn't believe that he was there. And I said, um, very calmly, "Oh, of course, sir." as if I didn't know who he was. And he sits down, he talks to his then wife, uh, Valerie, for about five minutes. And I'm just like sitting there watching this comedian on TV and then looking over uh, on the edge of my bed and watching Robin Williams talk to his wife. And he hangs up and then he was very nice. He didn't want to just get up and leave. And he just engages me in conversation about how my career is going. And he has seen me at the store. And, uh, and then he very, and he asks who the comedian is on TV I'm watching. And he politely gets up and leaves. And I thought to myself, one, should I have talked to him about the script? <laughs> but at that moment, it didn't even enter my head. I just, it was, I was just, I couldn't believe what was happening here. The lesson I got though, was the universal force. The universe, you put it out there in the world. I you know, a year earlier, all I had wanted to do year and a half, all I wanted to do in life was to meet Robin Williams. Year and a half later, the man walks into my room, sits on my bed and talks to me. <laughs> so I thought to myself, you know, I should probably start thinking about finding, asking uh, the universe for a famous woman to come in and sit. <laughs> you know, Susan Anton at the time was my, was, was a favorite. So I started putting it out there and that never happened. And, uh, and that's my story of my early beginning in Los Angeles. <laughs> That's a great story. And you you were a paid regular, or you still are a paid regular at the Comedy Store. You know, I haven't done stand-up. I, I could tell you another story about my last stand-up routine, which was Evening at the Improv, hmm. and how I forgot the uh, the next joke right through the, right in the middle of the show. <laughs> what do you mean? I was doing my set, and uh, and it's a very friendly audience because they're on TV. Everyone's on TV. And, yeah. And right in the middle of it. I, now, I hadn't done stand-up in five years before this evening at the improv because I was doing my head of the class show and I just kind of forgot about it. And then I was asked to do be the special guest comic at evening. At the so I went up and uh, a couple, just a couple times to get ready for it at the, the improv and the comedy store. And uh, so I wasn't, I, I thought I was prepared, but right in the middle of it, I just forgot whatever the next joke was. <laughs> wow. And it wasn't one of those things wherein, you know, Oh, nobody knew. No, it was a long half a minute pause. And what did you do? While I recalibrated. Well, funny thing is, uh, when I was working the comedy store just the week before to get ready for this, I ran, I ran into Andrew uh, Clay, who I had not seen in many years. And he goes, Hey, fish cakes. Uh, let's go talk. And I said, Andy, listen, I'm really, (laughs) I'm really, uh, nervous. I'm getting ready to go on. And he says, you don't gotta do good. Just get up there and say, Hey, I don't gotta be funny. I got a lot of dough, right? <laughs> so I'm saying, yeah, that would really work for me. Thanks, yeah. Andy. And then I did my set. So here I am, 30 seconds of silence, and I didn't know what to do. I, I made a joke about you know, trying to scare Bud, and I got a little, <laughs> a little nervous laughter. And then finally, I just came out with Andy's line, and I said, you know, I don't have to be funny tonight. I got a lot of dough. And it got a huge laugh. Wow. And I think it was just because it was so out of character for me. But that's such a good lesson <laughs> in that you were truthful and honest in the mi- in the minute. You yes. know, you were, you were right present. Yes, exactly. And that way, every, you broke that tension. That is so clever. And in that laugh, yeah. I remember the next joke. Yeah. So I knew they'd be able to edit it together and it would look. Well, that's the thing with a stand-up career is that, you know, if you become a stand-up comedian, you're basically... Uh, you're basically giving yourself one script and you've got to perfect that script. And you do essentially the exact same show night after night. Exactly. It's the same set, the same five minutes, the same 10 minutes. And so there really isn't any room for you to forget your material. That's true. There's no, there's no room for that. This is an improv. But if he, he, if it was back when he was doing it all the time, you never would have forgotten that. That is true. It just that you, you, it's a you just you just it's brought it back to right. it's like you used to be a sprinter in the Olympics yeah. and we we're yes. forty. They said, "Can you do an exhibition sprint?" You said, "Sure," and you ran around the block once. Yeah, that is true. and then you were ready. To, it's, oh, and your hamstring tears. That's good true. running like, analogy, Hannes. Yeah. Especially That's pretty good. For someone I don't believe who has ever run before. I have run toward pie. 
<laughs> toward pie. Yes. Well, your name, Dan, is on the building of the comedy store. Yes, I, I, I'm very uh, honored to have it there with no all the doubt. other comedians. Yeah, because uh, I I did work there for for all those uh, yeah. all those years. Uh, I even participated in a seance there with Sam Kennison and uh, Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, so now, Sam Kennison, I gotta say, what I met him because yeah. when I was in college in Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. there was uh, his brother Bill Kennison opened a comedy club. Oh yeah, the first one I ever worked at, the first official one. Yeah, I uh, called the Comedy Cellar, oh. and all these again it was Sam. Bill Sam came in, and all his friends Fred Asparagus. Oh, Freddie, uh, Carla Bove. Uh, I love Freddie Asparagus. Yes. Freddie, yeah, he died unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, God, it's quite a few years ago now. Yeah. Okay, so let's That's hear about point. the seance yeah, at the comedy store. What year was it? This has to be 1982. It was at my, my, my three-year stint, really, at the comedy store as a gopher and living in the house with all the comedians. Uh, well, a year before I got out to Los Angeles, there was a comedian named Steve Lubetkin. Um, there's a great book called I'm Dying Up Here which has his story in it. But mm -hmm. he uh, unfortunately uh, ended his life when he, after he was told he couldn't work at the comedy store anymore. He went to the top of the Hyatt Hotel next to the comedy store parking lot and uh, dove into the parking lot in order to uh, protest uh, his uh, departure. So, Well, that was all during the strike. That was the whole comedy store strike. Yes, exactly. Right. And I was, uh, So I didn't know anything about that, but I, I heard about him after I got out but here. But basically the comedians wanted to be paid and Mitzi said, no, you don't need to be paid. This is yeah. a workout room and mm -hmm. you should be honored to be here at all. Yes, exactly. And so the comedian, most, a lot of comedians said, we're not working anymore. Right. And then other people did work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And, and Steve was uh, very active in the strike apparently. And so Mitzi told him afterwards that he couldn't work there anymore. So he, and he was mentally ill, clearly. I, 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 yes, absolutely. To do, yeah. to, you know, to, to take that step, obviously there were, there, there were some problems. Um, now, Sam Kinison, before he was a comedian, was a real life preacher. Right. And, yep. and he felt a very close connection with the, the other world. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Andrew Clay was one of my housemates, and he and I were having drinks in the main room, in the big, the big, the largest room at the comedy store. Yeah. After the show was over, and it was let's say one thirty a.m., Sam comes over to us. Sam was a doorman at the time, and he has finished counting receipts. And he comes over to us very seriously. He says, "You guys got to help me." Steve Lubetkin's ghost is up in the rafters above the comedy store, and we have to have a seance. Wow! So Clay and I just started laughing. We we're like, <laughs> and he says, "No, no, I'm serious." You have to help me do it. And uh, so we go, uh, well, okay. And we climb up this, this little rickety wooden ladder that uh, leads up to a platform on one side. If you crawl, you can crawl to the lighting booth. But wait a minute. So wait, you're, you go up to the belly room. Oh no no not no, the no. belly room we're okay. in the main so you're room in the main room so you go up to the, the right. light or the sound booth yes if you well if you're facing the stage it's that it's okay. all way off to the left if you go to the left you're at the sound booth okay if you go to the right there's a uh, it leads to a closet door that looks like it hasn't been opened since the <laughs> 1940s when okay. it, the place was Ciro's and owned by the mafia right okay so Sam says that he's he has a very strong feeling that Steve's ghost is behind this door and that we have to have a seance to help him move <laughs> move on. And Clay and I are still like looking at each other like, is this guy serious? But Sam is like, no, we got to do this. So I'm Sam was a powerful personality. He was. He, yeah. he can get you to do yeah. uh, most anything. So um, we're hold, he has us hold hands. I'm between Sam Kinnison and Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> Probably the only time that has happened. Uh, yeah. People holding hands with those two. And Sam starts his spiel. Steve, and, th and then Clay and I start, you know, giggling, literally. And yeah. Sam goes, you guys are going to laugh. We can't do this. We said, okay, okay. He was very serious. Are you sitting or standing? Standing. Okay. Yeah. And Sam goes, okay, Steve, can you hear us? We are here for you. Uh, it is time for your soul to move on to the other side. He goes on for four minutes with this spiel. And Clay and I are just, you know, kind of wide-eyed listening to him because he's very serious and very powerful. And at the end of which he says, if you are ready to move on, give us a sign. Now, all I can figure on an earthly plane, maybe, is that maybe an aluminum duct gave, if that, but we just heard coming from behind this door, this <laughs> very ominous, long, <laughs> sound. <laughs> the three of us, Sam included, ran like the three stooges running from the mummy. Oh, my God. We literally went, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And the three of us are trying to get down the ladder. 
and like get your keep go get your foot out of my face we'll just keep on moving <laughs> and we get down to the bottom of the uh, to the, the floor and we're kind of shaken up and uh, we look at each other and we're a little like scared a little embarrassed <laughs> and we just kind of stood there no one said a word and we just kind of took a breath and we literally just walked separately away <laughs> wow and didn't talk about it again till uh, well, we never, the three of us never discussed it. No kidding. Never discussed it. I only talked about it um, when I ran into uh, Andrew Dice Clay that night at the comedy store when I was getting ready to do my show again, because someone else had heard about it. And then yeah. what did you say? Well, uh, we, uh, someone else said, hey, I heard you got, I heard some story about a ghost yeah. of Steve Lebeckin and, and Clay and I looked at each other because we'd never mentioned it. It was like the thing that would go unmentioned as far yeah. as we were concerned. Yeah. But we just said, okay. And we, we both told the story. The story's corroborated exactly, except wow. he heard loud knocking coming from behind the door, he said. Huh. I don't remember any knocking. I remember the whoosh yeah. sound. Uh, That's one of like a that? million ghost stories out of, out of the comedy store. Yeah. We're always saying oh, yeah. that they're seeing stuff. Yeah, there. I've yeah. definitely felt weird vibes in the green room up there. It's a, it's a, First of all, there's a lot of weird staircases, and there's a lot of uneven stairs, it seems, not for the public to use, but in yeah, the back, yeah, like no, by the it's, kitchen. And it it's just, almost like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. There's yeah. something just is not quite, yeah, the architecture is like right off. There. But yeah. they also have gotten all brand new carpeting and brand new tables and chairs, and the shows are going phenomenally. So the place is on fire, as is the improv. No, so no, no, the ghosts, is the ghosts back. never interrupt drink service. <laughs> no, they know where the bread is, is buttered. No yes. doubt about it. But let me ask you this. You have had so much success in television, you know, series and different sitcoms. And I, I would imagine if you do have that amount of, you know, some amount of success and you do have money coming in, it would make stand up then somewhat unappealing. Well, it wasn't that it was unappealing. It was that for me that uh, when I was coming up as a stand up comic, I had the passion for it. I could not wait to get on stage. I would do anything I could to get any stage time anywhere. There was a, there was a, an Iranian discotheque where the Beverly <laughs> center is now called yeah. Oscos. Yeah. And they had a comedy cave down there. So you, you, I'd go on and, and that actually helped me become a physical comic because a lot of people didn't understand English. <laughs> so you'd have to gesticulate and, and uh, make funny faces and yeah. things. So um, that got that part of my career going really, I think. Uh, and then there are just all the little coffee shops. There is just uh, all the coffee shops. Right. But then at some point you start doing, you know, getting some work and you got ahead of the class and right. you're doing a regular show. So first of all, you're working long hours and you yeah. don't have time to go out. Right. I didn't, I didn't have time for, to, uh, to do stand up really. If I, you know, obviously if I, if it was still a part of me, but I think the thing was, uh, Steve Martin once said the comics fall under one of two categories. Either they got... Uh, too much attention as children are now trying to get that attention back in some way, yeah. or they didn't get any attention as children and sure. they're trying to find that. I, if if either I came under the the uh, the former and that I got too much attention, so here I was, you know, I got the attention while I was doing stand up, and now when I was on these sitcoms, especially like the head of the class where I played Arvid, this nerdy character, and yeah, uh, yeah. was very recognizable at that time. You youngsters may not remember this was a huge hit. Huge, yeah. huge right, right. network show. Right, right, right. Uh, and when there were three networks, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so I got all the attention I needed. So that when the show ended, and I thought, uh, kind of in a mad panic, I should probably do stand up again. Uh, whereas before, there's a guy sitting in the front row not laughing, and I, I would think, I gotta make that guy laugh. If I don't make that guy laugh, I'm a failure. Now, uh, after head of the class, the guy sitting there in the front row with his arms folded, looking at me, I would go. I, I would feel like a Joe Pesci, you know, yeah. like I got to make you laugh. What am I, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a clown. I'm not your fucking clown asshole. Yeah, well, just, it's, yeah. it's, and also it's like stand up. You, you have to want it so badly that it isn't about the money because yes. I know I did stand up uh, feverishly for about three or four years, like every night of yeah. the week except maybe one night a month I wouldn't go out. And I didn't care if it was in a Starbucks or if it was at an open mic at the comedy store. It didn't matter. I had to get up. But then I started working in commercials and I got a couple of gigs. And then all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go to that coffee shop yeah. at 10 o'clock at night to right. sit with seven other comics who are rolling their eyes yeah, and exactly. hate me and I hate them. <laughs> or, you know, not necessarily hate, but you know, it's yeah. like you're driving late at night. It's LA. I'm a woman. I'm by myself. And so when you start making money in other ways, it becomes, you know, less appealing. And I guess yeah. I didn't have enough drive 
I right, mean, I right, guess right. personally, I didn't have enough because I don't, I don't do it anymore. Yeah. Okay. Also, I found that I'm not funny enough. You know, I just don't feel like I was ever that funny enough. Now, yeah. storytelling is different because I've got some good stories, but you know, comedy, stand up comedy, some people either have it or they don't have right. it. There's, yeah. there's that. And there's also the, the aspect of there's an obsessive compulsive quality to yeah. it. You have which to, is, you have like, to be dying. Yeah, to I get always up say there. this, like if anybody ever says to any comedian, do you think I should try stand up comedy? That person should say no. Yeah. Because yeah. if, if they're saying no can stop you, then you are not supposed to do it. It's like, it should be impossible for you to not do it yes. or you're doing the wrong thing. As absolutely. absolutely and at true. some point, I think some people kind of work their way out of that. I remember mm -hmm. like, ah, you got to have the attention. And then you're like, you know what? I can go four days. Yeah. Without getting up in front of people. Yeah. When you start, you can't take it. Mm -hmm. you, you're like, I could be in front of somebody yeah. right now. Yes. I could be doing comedy right now. Yeah. And eventually you're just like, you know, so unless you're the person who just cannot sit in their own thoughts right. you in their up, house. You grew up in New Jersey and you did have a supportive family. I did. My mom's a second grade teacher and dad's a CPA. And <laughs> uh, so I, I, you know, I had the very- Brothers uh, and sisters? Yeah. Two older brothers, Bill and Gary. And so you go to Penn State University just for two years. Yes, I was very anxious to be an actor, and they weren't hiring there. Yeah. So uh, I left. My mother, uh, especially being an educator, wanted me to finish. But after a year, I already knew that I wanted to be a stand-up comic and, wow. and, and to use that for acting. So I was, uh, but she prom I, I, she made me promise her I would do, would do another year. So I did it really just for her. Yeah. So that was the third year or the second. That year? was the second. Second year. year. Yeah. So um, how old were you when you got head of the class? Uh, I had been out here for six years. I came out when I was 20. So I, I was actually 27 when I started. 27 playing. years old playing high school Play, kid. Yeah, ex absolutely. Well, and, I was the baby face. And how old were the other <laughs> and the cast big, members? And the big nose. Um, uh, they were, uh, the, the second oldest was just a year younger than me. But uh, the 13 year old girl on the show who was like the genius, she was actually 13. And a lot of them were. Oh, I were see. Pretty okay. Much around because that age. I think of movies like Grease and John oh, Travolta yeah. and Olivia Newton John, they were in their 30s. Absolutely. Yeah, playing yeah, yeah. high yeah. school children. Right, right. I mean, often, though, they take like a teenager and they'll have like an 18 year old play 12 or 13 or 14 yes. so that they can work yeah, longer work, hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So, but I'm sort of surprised that they took a 27, a 27 year old and said, you're now 14. Or well, so, I, I lied. I mean, yeah. they asked me how old I was, uh, and I was prepared because I, I knew they were going to ask. Yeah. The very first audition, how old are you? 22. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, after our 100th episode, uh, at the we had a, a party, and by that time they knew how old I was. And I asked one of the producers, uh, if I had told you I was 27, would I have gotten the part? And he said, no. I never no. Asked, he, said, he said, I never asked you again, did I? Really? Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. of course they're going to find out yeah. because they're going to know as soon as you give them your social security and number and medical or whatever. records and all that sort of And so they, they don't did care know, about but that. they don't they just, care. They need he, to know. Yeah. He just wanted to hear it. Oh. So tell us how much you had been auditioning before you got that role and what made that audition feel different to you? Like, how did it come about? Yes. Well, I, I started auditioning uh, while I was at the comedy store. I would hear, uh, I would listen to the other comics who had uh, big agents. Uh, I didn't even have an agent at the time. Uh, they would like to, the, the other comics love to brag about the parts they were up for. So I would listen to it and then I would either have, you know, my quote unquote manager, or I would just usually act as my own manager or have a friend say that he's my manager. And yeah. at that time you could call up any studio and talk, get yeah. to any casting director, uh, at least their uh, assistant. Yeah. Uh, so there was a part yeah. uh, that a friend, one of my comedy store friends was up for uh, in a series that was to star Tim Curry. And they needed like an Igor type character. So, well, I can do an Igor type character. So I called up as my own manager and said, there's this guy, Dan Frischman. He's new. He's at the comedy store. You got to see him. And they said, well, have him, uh, you know, just, just send his picture and resume. So the next day I walked into the office with my picture and resume. My manager said that I should walk in, said, I mean, should bring you this uh, picture and resume. And I said, can I get it? I'd like to get an audition. And uh, she just you know, looked at me and said, well, you know, without a, uh, you know, an agent, an appointment how, or an how are you going to do that? Yeah. I, right. I can't let you into the you know, casting director. And uh, so I charmed her with a magic trick and she liked my little magic trick. What was the <laughs> trick? It was called the invisible deck that all magicians know. It's a, it's a trick where uh, someone names a card and it's upside down on the deck. Well, no, when I take out the, how deck. do you do that? Magic. How do you do that? God, you can't very, tell very well. That. Thank you. Tell me now. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Name a card. Uh, Ace of Diamonds. That would be the card that was upside down. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. <laughs> Even if he explained it to us, we probably wouldn't 
get it on the first try. I yeah, want to yeah, know yeah, so bad. I, yeah. I'd, I'd, I have so many questions. Last about time we went magic. to the Magic Castle, Christine has a. Are you still a member of the Magic no, Castle? No, dude. Okay. I told you they, yeah. they now they started charging like a thousand dollars a year. Oh, yeah, okay. I was Before a member then. for like nine years. So we went there and over. and we run into a. Uh, and Christine has been drinking a lot of wine by the end of the night. This is not a criticism. It's just a fact. And we happen to run into this, you know, we're in some lower level. And he goes, oh, you know, and he's just talking. To, you know, there's four of us there. So he's just talking to us. And he does like, he does something. He does a trick. And normally you'd go, that's amazing. Christine is at a point at the point she's like, oh, my God. Is, <laughs> how the fuck did you do? How the fuck? Because you are wasted. And uh, you were like, you literally believed it was actual magic. You are it was every, one of the funniest every, things I've ever you're seen. You're every magician's dream. Everybody wants that <laughs> yeah. reaction to it. It is unbelievable. Like you, you could not believe. I, I can't believe what they do. Yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah. Magic yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so go ahead. So you've been doing. You, you're, okay, so you did you get into the you charm with the magic so trick? I charmed, so I charmed the the, uh, the casting director's assistant with a magic trick, and and uh, and I said, well, uh, she said, I'm sorry, but I still can't. I said, can I read it for you? I because the, the the sides the script was sitting there, and she's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so I read the part for the assistant, and she said thank you, and she just took my. Uh, my resume, which had literally like high school and a couple of college parts on yeah. there. Plays, yeah. Penn State University became, you know, uh, uh, Penn Regional Theater, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I, I don't mind lying at all about um, when it comes to showbiz. Uh, what were your special skills? Magic. Well, it was uh, magic, juggling, ventriloquism. Yeah. Uh, accents. It just. The, your, Did your, you do. Um, I uh, have horseback riding on mine because I rode a rented horse once in Griffith Park. There you go. So absolutely. Yeah, Did you that? have manual and standard transmission? Can drive? Oh, no. I, <laughs> I did drive. not have that. <laughs> did you have rollerblading? No. Did I you had, have volleyball? I had, I had great hands. I wrote great hands because there are <laughs> really? hand model jobs you can yeah. get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Level. Terrific hands. So. Um, did she? Oh yes. Eventually so pass I, it on, or right. So I read. For, so I read for the secretary, for the for the assistant, and oh, then I, I uh, weeks passed. Uh, I heard that this uh, pilot did not did not even go. Yeah. Uh, apparently, they uh, it was to star Tim Curry, as I mentioned, and no one told Tim Curry. <laughs> so, I saw the thing. It was it was a dead it was a, it was a, a, a dead issue. But then, literally, I'm sitting at the comedy store house. I didn't have an answering machine, so it was a good thing I was sitting there. That assistant calls me and she said, there's one line open on the show called it's a living with waitresses. Uh, and I, if you can get down, how fast you can get down here. I said, I can be there in 10 minutes. I know it was going to take me at least a half hour to get yeah. there. Yeah. And she said, well, if you get down here, we, you know, you can read this, this part. And I said, great. I'll be right. I'll be right there. What's the, what's the part? She said, it's for a street tough. <laughs> and I said, do you remember what I look like? Because you know I'm thin now, yeah. but then I was a, you know a scrawny. And she said, yeah. "Look, the, you know, the worst that'll happen is you'll meet the casting director." Yeah. So I threw on like a, a a black and red plaid shirt, and I rolled up the sleeves and mussed up my hair. I look like Mr. Green Jeans, you know, on a <laughs> bender. And I, and I went down there, and uh, the part was between me and this huge Neanderthal-looking guy, street tough guy with the real tattoos, and <laughs> and I we both read. And I didn't know how to be a street tough, but I, from doing my comedy and stand up and uh, improvisation, I knew how to be funny. So I did my funny version of a street tough. Yeah. They sent me and uh, the other guy down and they gave me the part. So that was, that wow. was, that was how I first, you know, uh, did By it. That guy later jumped off the Hilton because <laughs> he was like, yeah. really? I lost the street tough to this guy. So then what? <laughs> I couldn't. Well, then from, then they invited me. I got a huge laugh on that one line and they invited me back twice more. And then the show got canceled, but I did have a, uh, you know, my VHS tape. So you were the waiter, the dishwasher? What I was, was this uh, yes, I was the uh, stupid dishwasher. What was the name, uh, was the name of the was, Jillian? No. It was Ann Jillian. Uh, Ann Jillian, the, the waitresses in the revolving right, restaurant. Right, I Louise see. Lasser. Paul Kreppel was the kind of smarmy piano player. <laughs> Uh, and Paul's uh, a, a, a where have they not set a sitcom? You know that's true. So, uh, the, the, a that, brothel. That assistant, by the way, I have to I have to tell you, was uh, an actress actually named Susan Rattan, who uh, was later on uh, a regular on L.A. Law. Huh. So she, Wait a minute, she, I remember. she did well too. Wait a minute. She was she was Arnie Becker's yeah assistant. Okay, oh so my for, god! So, yes, I totally remember her. Okay, yeah. so you had a couple of, of reoccur, uh, you know, a, a small guest. Well, what do you right. call that? A small you're, reoccurring you're, you're or guest a guest, ro guest roles. Okay. So, so from that, I had a videotape of my work, which yeah. was like these three, uh, the same yeah. character doing three different uh, segments, and uh, and then a woman who said she was a manager at the comedy store 
wanted to represent me and I gave her this tape and she gave it to my agent who be the, the person who became my agent for the next 20 years. Wow. That's yeah. a great story. Yeah. And then how often did you go out for different shows before you got head of the class? Because even getting an audition is difficult in this town. It is. Let alone actually landing a job. It's, it, it's true. I, I, I hit a little niche market of the, uh, the goofy nerd. Quirky. The quirky, goofy, big nose nerd. So I did get a, a lot of little parts. I would just keep getting little, little and, and then a year went by, I didn't get any, you know, nothing would go on. And then I would get another part. So it was about at the six year mark that I heard about this head of the class show. Uh, and, but they were at that time going for actual 16 year olds. So I didn't even think about it. But then my agent just, I, I thought the thing was cast and shot already, but my agent said, they're still looking for people. Uh, why don't you, can you go down and read for this, or this nerdy Arvid role, the character named Arvid. That's and such a strange name, A-R-V-I-D. I never heard that the name in my life. It was a, a real person. Uh, one of the producers, uh, Michael Elias, had a, uh, a neighbor in Canada named uh Hmm. It still Arvid, doesn't name, make it right. Arvid, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't make doesn't it right. Doesn't make it right. So I walked in and the casting director, Mitty Marin, looked at me and said, oh, you could do this. And I walked in and all I'd been doing at the comedy store was playing nerds in these, you know, improv things. So I, it was in my back pocket and yeah. within literally like three days, it was my part. Wow. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And how long did the show run? Five years. Five years. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then it did hit the syndication mark of 100 yes. shows. Yes, it did. How so, many shows did it, did you do in the end? I'm, I'm going to guess a hundred and, 10. I'm that's my it's just a guess. Yeah, but it was over 100. That's yeah. the important thing. Right. And you worked with Tony Randall, you worked with Carol O'Connor. Oh yeah. I I loved uh, Tony Randall was also an idol of mine. I I actually think he's a, a much underrated uh actor. Of, yeah, absolutely. Of, of yesteryear cuz he he was he could do it all. Um probably Jack Lem is my favorite by the way of all of all time cuz he you know he could he was excellent at drama and comedy and, and he yeah. got to do he got to do both. I remember Tony doing the Tony Randall's show, Love Sydney. Tony Randall was not happy, a happy camper at the time. He lived in New York and didn't like being in Los Angeles. So uh, he was a little sour, but he was nice to me. Um, so you had a part on the show. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did just a little, a little, yeah. a little like a five liner. And then Carol O'Connor was a very nice man. And um, I did mime on that show. That show wait, what, what, wait, what did you work with Carol O'Connor on? Oh, it was actually Archie Bunker's place. Oh, at, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Oh, yeah. but just technically after yes. All in the Family. Right, yeah. right, right. Uh, no, no longer quite had the cachet of all in the family, but yeah. it was still Cal O'Connor as yeah. Archie Bunker. And um, that job came about because a friend of mine who's like in the construction industry called me and said his next door neighbor is looking for someone uh, who does mime. Uh, and I thought, OK, he wants a, a kid's party. Well, I'll, I'll, hmm. let me get, I'll, I'll call him and, and talk him into a, a magic show instead mm -hmm. of a mime. And I, so I call up this person. I thought it's you know, it, it going to be a birthday. And uh and the, 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 it was a woman who happened to be uh, Danielle Brisbois' manager, who was, she was an actress on the show. Yeah, on yeah, Archie it's a Bunker's kid. Place. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, if you can do mime, I can get you an audition this afternoon on Archie Bunker's Place. And I said, well, mime is what I do. Wow. <laughs> I, I had never done mime. I had n not once tried to you know, make a fake building or anything. And, uh, but I just, I had like a half hour to practice. And, you know, if you're an actor, you just, you just. Boy, Dan, Assume so what I've learned from you is yeah, just Yeah, lying is lie. very important. Yes. I'll lie. be there in 10 but minutes. But you know, you know exactly. how you, I just realized how you get away with lying in Hollywood, which is you're going in there. You if, if the person knew anything about mime, they'd be like, this is bullshit. The yeah. person you're going in for they don't know anything about mime. But they don't know you're doing it wrong. In addition, yeah, the casting no in addition, the casting director wants you to get it right because they need to book the spot and move on. They've got other things to do. So yeah. I think they, when an actor walks in, they have an expectation. They want you to do well. I don't think they want you yeah. to screw up. So yeah. if you have yeah. a certain amount of confidence, like no, 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 I got this, and you make them feel safe, mm -hmm. like no worries, I got this, and then you know you can move on. I got this. Yeah. yeah. That they. They are like, okay, good. You yeah. take care of that. I'm going to move on. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. And one of the reasons I feel like I booked so many jobs is like, like before head of the class was because I loved auditioning. Yeah. To me, that was a performance. It was like getting on stage to do stand up. And and what you say is spot on. I tell that to actors all the time that uh, they want you to be good. Of course they do. Yeah, and they because, want you because to. Yeah, they have a problem. Yeah. Not you. Yeah. They have to fill the spot. Okay, so we, I could talk to you all night, Dan. I love Hollywood talk. I really do. But we have to move on. But before we do, I wanted to ask you um, about Robin Williams. You said he was your hero, and you said uh, about that spec script that you 
that you wrote. There is rumors. There have been rumors in the past, you know, before he passed, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but there's yeah. been a lot of rumors that Robin Williams stole a lot of people's material. Yeah. I, I've heard that. I know he threw a, I, I heard stories where he threw uh, some comedian threw him up against the wall at the improv and said, pay me asshole. I've heard stories that he did pay up then and he when did. that would happen. He did. And I also heard stories that some comedians wouldn't go on stage if they saw him in the room because they knew he would turn around and take it out of there and use it somewhere else. Right. And if, you know, he had the kind of brain that I think just was like all over the place. So I would, in his defense, say that sometimes it just fit the moment and he would just, it would just come out like, you know, like throw up. I mean, he didn't yeah, even he think about it. You, yeah. I think it wasn't that he was stealing lines yeah. per se, but it was like, it'd be a funny idea and it would just all be in there. And then he's improvising and it just, whatever fit right. that moment, right. he would say it and it would be the same idea, but yet it's, it, it's, 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 yeah, it would come out in, in, in his own way, but he would have, you know, he would have effectively. Because when it. you said, you know, you said the script, the incredible shrinking. Yeah, so that I mean, nothing ever came of that. You never. No, no. Was, result. Because there the is some irony there that that would have taken place right after you had handed that script to somebody. That, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, somebody at, absolutely. At the very, at the very I least, remember. A coincidence. <laughs> that gives strange. you a little taste of Hollywood before, yeah. before, before you ever I've, got here. Before I've stepped I have forward. no idea who wrote this script for Seinfeld of the, I love Seinfeld. There was this uh, where where uh, Elaine gets involved with her her publishing boss is going to sell muffin tops. Yeah. Only. Right. That was the <laughs> problem. Uh, within six months of seeing that on the air, I saw a guy at the comedy store who I cannot remember. And he did a whole bit about why do you even make the rest of the muffin? The muffin top is what everybody wants. Why do mm -hmm. you yeah. throw away the stump? And then I'm watching it. I'm like, did that guy write this fucking script? Cause it's the same exact. Yeah. And I know, I know whoever wrote that or maybe somebody suggested to him. Yeah. Saw that, that comic and said, one of the characters will work at a store that sells nothing but muffin tops. Right, right. And it's like, what? And I was like, is he going to sue? But what's he going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. Like, uh, it, it's kind of a normal idea. Like, well, yeah, everybody likes to eat that part. Everybody yeah. likes to eat the crust of the pizza, not the, or some mm -hmm. people never want to eat the crust, you know? But he, yeah. It's, That's true. it's weird. But those people are animals. I I must have crust in every bite of pizza. By hey, the way. listen, mm -hmm. uh, Dan, you want to play some shotgun story worthy? Absolutely. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! Uh, hired. So I, the only job I ever had where I had a, like a, a regular boss show up nine to five job was when I was a, um, was 17 and doing magic shows at kids parties, but, or even like 16. And but there was one summer where in, uh Oh, <laughs> where in the, the, the jobs were slow. So I worked at a confectionery store. I got fired after, uh, two weeks because I was a, a soda jerk, a shop boy. Uh, I, I had like five jobs and I was terrible at all of them. There you go. Oh my gosh. That's an amazing story. So 33 seconds. Oh, that was only 33. Okay. How did you, wait a minute. Are you telling me you never worked a nine to five job? That was the only time. That, that and, and being a gopher at the comedy store where we're at. And that's not a nine to five job. Yeah, that's, well, that, that was a 24 hour job. Missy would call you at any hour of the day What's or the night. strangest thing she had you do? Uh, I would have to go pick up her dog from her house in Beverly Hills. Did you take Polly to school? Uh, I never took Polly to school. I would play with Polly. We, we you know, we were playing on this trampoline in the backyard. Yeah. But I remember having to go pick up her, her, her dog. Oh, I actually remember when, um, I, I wanted to leave the job so badly. And, uh, after six months, uh, I went and told Missy, I said, you know, I said I'm getting more magic shows. And I, uh, I was kind of coerced into taking the job. She yeah. pretty much told me that if I wanted to work at the comedy store, I had to be her gopher. Yeah. So I went, so after I figured six months of hard time, I was ready to, you know, to, to get yeah. the job. So I went to her house and I, I said, Missy, I'd like to talk to you. And, and Paulie is there. And she said, okay, Paulie, get out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Paul is just like, oh, okay. And he leaves. And, uh, so I'm talking to Mitzi about the thing and she's very, being very understanding. And then Polly comes back with her dog, her little dog in one hand and then ginormous kitchen knife in the other hand <laughs> pointed at the dog and says, I'm going to do it, mom. I'm going to kill the dog. 
And Mitzi's just like, just midstream in the conversation goes, well, I think that Polly put Muffy down. I did, I did, I did. So, <laughs> Isn't that funny? That sounds like a really funny family. Yeah. That's oh awesome. God. Well, listen, thanks so much for coming and sharing your story today. This was great. I've had such a great time. One more thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. Remember when you said there was an emergency break-in? Oh, yeah. That was like a big deal. Oh, yeah. In the 70s and 80s, yeah. like when we only had landlines. That's true. Explain the emergency break-in. The, the emergency break-in is where it, it, it would cost a dollar. Yeah. It would, it, if, uh, and it's, wow. if someone, if you called somebody and, and, and you get a busy signal, you can actually dial the operator. They would Which come was zero. You zero. hit zero. Yes. And, and the operator comes you would on. dial zero. That's right. right. All exactly. the way around. That's yeah. right. That's right. We, we are, I remember my phone number was like Tucker seven, five, eight, three, five. And, uh, so the, and you would just say, I'd like to do an emergency break in. And they'd say, okay, hold please. Yeah. And then you'd wait and wait and wait. And someone would pick up going, Hello. <laughs> and then it was, that yeah. was it. I mean, it was more of an emergency. And it would never yeah. be an emergency. Exactly. Oh, okay. uh, you have an emergency phone call from an emergency. Emergency. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember we used to call the operator to get the correct time. Yeah. May I have the correct time, please? It's 702 or whatever. You, you want to hear Not what? even the recording. You're saying a live operator. Yeah, you call the operator to ask for what time it was. You want to hear one of my stand-up jokes from back when? <laughs> yeah, let Invo- Involved the phone company. They had they had an ad that I did a, 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 a funny on. Uh, so my ad was um, how they're, they're, the phone company is desperate now. They're, trying to, they're doing anything to get people to, to, to use, the, use the company. So I, uh, here's an ad that I just heard. <laughs> uh, use the phone to call a friend. Use the phone to be a friend. Use the phone to find out when. Use the fucking phone. <laughs> that, was, that was one of my, one of my early stand-up comedy jokes. I like jokes. that. It's a little Thank jingle. You. Yeah, there you go. All right. Hey, thanks so much again for coming in to tell your story today, Dan. You're such a funny guy. Well, thank it's you. really, really awesome. interesting. Thank you. And I want to By thank the way, everybody. he was juggling rabbits the whole time. <laughs> ne- magic never goes away. And I want to thank everybody here at Sideshow Network, including Avery Pearson on sound. Thanks, Avery. Thank you, Avery. And of course... Sean Merrick and Roddy Swearingen and of course John Thomas Griffith you know he's the one who wrote the theme song Follow Me I would like Dan to make him disappear <laughs> <laughs> and one more time on behalf of our storyteller tonight Dan Frischman and of course on behalf of you Hannes Finney my dear friend and co-host my name is Christine Blackburn saying make it a story worthy week Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. place you've always wanted to try well you're there sharing plates with just one bite or on second thought maybe not sharing it's that good when you're with amex it's not if it's going to happen but when american express don't live life without it at progressive we know there's nothing like the feeling of riding a motorcycle with your crew on the open road that symphony of engines roaring in perfect harmony it's a feeling that would be impossible to recreate on the radio until now hit it jerry Oh, my word. Really, really terrible. Is that a glockenspiel, Jerry? Quote with Progressive and see if you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Uh, no, no, Jerry. It's over.